Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, I'm here today at the James D. Julia Auction House, taking a look at some of the guns that they are going to be selling in their upcoming Spring of 2017 firearms auction. And today, we are looking at a true one-of-a-kind pistol. This is the model of 1907 White Merrill pistol. And this is the specific pistol that was sent to the US military for inclusion in the 1907 US pistol trials. These trials are pretty uh, distinctive in that they are what ultimately would lead to the adoption of the 1911 by the US military. And there were a bunch of different entrants in this, this trial. Uh, the best known ones being what would become the 1911, the Colt Browning pistol. Uh, the Luger in 45 ACP was also entered into this trial, as was a Savage 45 caliber pistol. And those are the ones that did really well. But there are also a number of pistols that didn't do so well, and the White Merrill is one of those. This was developed by two guys in Massachusetts, uh, Joseph Chester White out of Chelsea, Massachusetts, and Samuel Merrill, who lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They put this together, they were approached by, or approached themselves, the uh, Ordnance Department, and were invited into the 1907 trials, where they sent this one specific pistol, as well as a manual, which is handy, because What's cool is reading that manual gives us some real insight into exactly what they were trying to accomplish with this design. And what's clever about this is they recognize that here we are in 1907, and this is still kind of the early days of the automatic pistol. There are militaries like the United States that are still using revolvers, and they're willing to try out self-loading pistols, but it's not a foregone conclusion that they're going to adopt one. This trial did include a couple of revolvers. Uh, the Webley Fosbury self-cocking revolver was in there, as were Colt and Smith and Wesson traditional standard revolvers. So what White and Merrill had done was put together an automatic pistol that they felt matched all the benefits of a revolver while also adding on the capabilities of a self-loading pistol. So, for example, there is an open plastic window on the left side grip. This was done so that you could visually see how many cartridges were left in the magazine. The idea there, as they point out in their manual, is that with a revolver it's quite easy to take a look and see if the gun is loaded or not, um, and to check the status of your cartridges by opening the cylinder and just looking at them. This, being able to see through the grip, gave you the same capability in this pistol. Uh, on a revolver, this, the, the revolver is typically quite accurate because the sights are affixed to the barrel. Well, they duplicated that as well here. The sights are fixed to the barrel. They also have a pretty distinctive feature that was only found on this pistol in the trials, and honestly has only been on a couple other guns even since, and that is the ability to charge the pistol one-handed with this lever. And that also stems back from uh, the idea of this being used in place of a revolver. Well, with a revolver, you can open, you can't load a revolver one-handed, but you can open the cylinder with one hand. Uh, to begin the loading or unloading process, and so they duplicated that on their automatic pistol. Now, for all of their hopes and dreams and their positive efforts and expectations going into this trial, the gun did not do so well. Uh, they fired a total of 211 rounds from it in the trial. Um, so first they fired a few rounds just to watch it function, and that's where the problem started. Uh, 20 rounds were fired just for observation. You know, let's start by shooting a couple rounds and seeing how everything works. And five of the twenty had various types of failures. Uh, this, I should point out, this has a ten round magazine in it. So they, they emptied two mags into the, the berm. They then proceeded to do some shooting for accuracy, which was actually pretty good at a hundred feet. Um, they had a, a ten round group with a 1.7 inch mean, uh, mean radius of dispersion. That's really actually not bad for an automatic pistol. Uh, and then they went into an endurance test. They did a couple other things first, but the big issue was the endurance test. They fired 110 rounds in the endurance trial, which is not a very long endurance trial, and they had all of 40 malfunctions in it. They had uh, malfunctions, the failures to properly feed, they had failures to properly eject, or properly extract out of the chamber, they had light strikes where they had to recock the hammer manually and, and fire around a second time to get it to actually detonate. They had failures to extract out of the chamber, they had failures to eject out of the gun. Everything that could go wrong really did. And through the course of this 110 round endurance trial, 
uh, pins were coming loose and screws were coming loose in the gun. So they kind of had to be, you know, you'd fire a magazine and you'd go back and tighten up all the screws and then you could fire another magazine. Um, perhaps it's a problem that they hadn't invented Loctite in 1907. But at, after that, the gun was pretty much unceremoniously dropped from the trials. At that point, 40 malfunctions in 110 rounds is not good enough. And that was the end of the trials for the White Merrill. However, it's a really interesting, it's a complicated gun, but it's got some really unique features. Maybe there's a reason, obviously, that they're unique. But we should take a look at them because they're really cool. On paper, this thing sounds really cool, and it's kind of a shame that it didn't live up to its potential in trials. Now, we have a magazine release on the back of the frame here which allows us to pull out this, a 10 round double stack magazine. Now this pistol is supposed to lock open manually when it when the magazine is empty, but it doesn't do that. I suspect it has been worn, probably over the course of US trials. However, we do have a manual hold open that I can engage here when the slide is all the way back. With that open, you can see there are two little cutouts here. This was designed to be fed from a 10 round stripper clip which was included with the gun, and so they did actually use that in the trials. Um, feed it by clip. You can reload the magazine, or have a second magazine, and replace that if you like. Or, as they point out in the, the manual, if it locks open on an empty magazine, it is then well suited to be a single loaded pistol, where you can have it open, drop a round in, hit the release, chamber that round, fire it, it will then lock open automatically again, and so forth, until you are in a position where you can actually fully reload it. I mentioned the transparent side panel, which is, by the way, riveted on and cannot be removed. Uh, and it's actually numbered 1, 2, and 3 to give you a reference mark for, okay, if I've got cartridges coming this far down the magazine, what does that actually indicate? Well, the, the last three cartridges are, are marked as such. Now, in their literature, uh, White and Merrill say that this gun has a half-cock notch, and so that it could be carried loaded with the hammer at half-cock. Um, although today that notch is nowhere to be found. So I suspect that's another part that uh, was a bit defective, wore down over the course of the last 110 years. Um, the alternative was to carry the gun with the chamber empty and a loaded magazine. Now normally that would mean you need two hands to rack the slide when you want to shoot. However, to avoid that issue, and again bring this kind of in line with revolver handling drill, White and Merrill added this two finger lever below the trigger guard. And what that does is cycle the slide for you. There we go. So it'll open it all the way up. Now it's supposed to lock open on an empty magazine, like I mentioned, but it doesn't. Um, however, with a loaded magazine in here, all you would have to do is cycle it like that. Now the gun's loaded, and you're ready to fire. They also pointed out that this gun was both quite accurate, because the sights are fixed to the barrel. So you can see there, rear sight, front sight, both on the barrel. And in addition, this had a six inch barrel in an eight and a half overall length, eight and a half inch overall length pistol. So one of White and Merrill's claims was that this was a more compact gun than a similarly equipped revolver, which on a revolver you'd have the cylinder here, and then you'd have to have your six inch barrel out there, and you'd have a much bigger gun overall. Contrary to what you might expect, this gun actually doesn't feel that bad in the hand. The trigger pull's not bad. The sights are a little small, but that's kind of in line with the time period. And I think one could probably shoot this reasonably well, assuming it functioned like it was supposed to. Speaking of that, let's take a look at how it does function. So technically speaking, this is a short recoil action, and it is a tilting slide action, which is, as far as I know, pretty much a unique idea. If you look at the front here, you'll see that the slide can actually lift slightly on and off the barrel. And when I pull the slide back, you can see a set of locking lugs here that look very much like 1911 locking lugs. However, in this case, what's happening is the barrel, or rather the slide, actually gets pulled down onto the barrel when you pull the trigger. That locks the two together and forces them to reciprocate as one unit. That allows pressure to drop before the slide then lifts up off of those locking lugs and continues backward on its own. Uh, total travel is like 5 30 seconds of an inch, so just a few millimeters. And what's really interesting about this design is if you're not actually pulling the trigger, 
The locking lugs are not engaged, and you can easily cycle the slide without having to move the barrel. When you pull the trigger, it actually pulls the slide down. See how this came down right here at the front of the barrel? That is just enough to lock the... Uh, to engage the locking lugs, and lock the slide together. Once it's in this position, the two go back together just a couple millimeters there, before they unlock, and it does make it really quite a uh, stiff bit of resistance because you have to cock the hammer at the same time. So it's a little hard for me to demonstrate that. But man, just that trigger engaging the locking surfaces is a really cool feature. So looking at this thing you would expect that disassembly is going to be a real mess. As a matter of fact, it's actually not that tricky. What you do is uh, cock the hammer, and then while pushing the slide and barrel slightly back, push this button down, and then the slide and the barrel come off the front of the gun. <laughs> there we go. Okay. A little bit finickier than I suggested, but the procedure is actually pretty simple. Now we can look at each of these pieces independently. Uh, by the way, there is one marking here on the slide which just says patent applied for. And then in the slide assembly we have the firing pin, which is spring-loaded, located right there. And then we have the hammer, of course, and the sear mechanism. So the hammer and sear are located here in the... well, the sear is located here in the side, and the trigger is going to push a bar up, which pushes on this, which releases the hammer. In that way it's actually kind of like the Luger. Beyond that, there's not a whole lot going on in here that we need to look at at the moment. Um, this is the front guide for the mainspring, and then we've got a lot of cut uh, grooves and rails for things to operate in. Here is our barrel mechanism. This is... just has a flat spring that puts pressure on it to lock the barrel in place. And then we have a recoil spring for the barrel, specifically. Because this is a short recoil gun, there needs to be some spring to push the barrel forward. Uh, usually this is uh, combined with the... usually use one spring to do the barrel and the slide. In this case they are split apart. So the recoil spring for the main gun is located here on the side, and doesn't ever touch the barrel, so there's a second spring to push the barrel forward right there. You'll notice this also has these ears on the side of the barrel. Those are basically part of the feed ramp. They help guide cartridges into the chamber when feeding. And of course we have our locking lugs here on the top. There is also one other marking on the barrel, which is white merrill. Uh, that and the patent applied for thing are the only markings on this pistol. It has no serial number. Now we've got a lot going on here in the frame. We have the main spring on the side. We have the manual charging lever. You can see this little uh, tooth right there. That's what pulls the slide back, and then this drops down at the bottom, which is what releases the slide to go forward. This thing, you can actually see it through the grip there. It's just a simple pair of levers. And then the trigger does several things at once. Looking at the side here, when you pull the trigger, one thing that's going on is this lug is going downward. That is what actually grabs the slide and pulls it down onto the locking lugs. Then this is going upward. That is what trips uh, the sear and drops the hammer. That is also the disconnector. So it goes up like so. And then when the slide comes back, it's going to push it in, which disconnects it. That resets the trigger, which is what means that it will not fire fully automatically. Only fires one shot per trigger pull. And this front hook, I'll be honest, haven't figured out what that front hook is for. It doesn't seem to interact with the barrel anywhere. It doesn't interact with the slide anywhere. I'm not sure what's going on there. The magazine was a double stack variety. Not not the first to do this. Um, of course, Savage had 32 caliber pistols right at about this time uh, that would have double stack magazines, but certainly an early example of a double stack magazine. What's kind of curious is that on the follower it has these two arrows, which don't appear to do anything 
help, except helpfully tell you which way is inside. So, uh, a lot of work went into this magazine. Clearly, handmade, custom fit, one mag for the gun. You can see a bit of the interaction between the barrel and the slide assembly here. This locks in right like that. And to reassemble the pistol, you reinstall the barrel in the slide, and then slide the whole thing down onto the frame. So, if you're interested in this, adding it to, well, making it the centerpiece, I suppose, of your collection of uh, interesting overcomplicated pistols that failed to beat the 1911, <laughs> uh, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to the Julia catalog page on this pistol, where you can see their pictures, provenance, description, etc. And if you're interested in it, you can attend the auction live in person, place a bid right through their website. Thanks for watching.